OK. Um, homework issues? OK. <laughs> Forgive me, I haven't gotten started on homework five yet. Okay, well, no one else has either. So. <laughs> I feel like the test will not get in the class tomorrow. Uh -huh. As with all second tests, I'm just kind of <laughs> Okay. Well, that's maybe it's a good thing, or, or it could be a bad thing. I have no second test except for the final. <laughs> well, that, that just means that my worry will be uh, restricted to a very short period of time this semester. <laughs> okay. Oh, that, that works. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the unfortunate thing is I'll be worrying about my students at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll probably be, be, be uh, more worried about myself with less time. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm. yeah. I've, I've gotten, gotten into a point where most of my failing students aren't failing if they're willing to put forth any effort whatsoever. There are always those few students that yeah. Yeah, too bad that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> there are always those few students bless you, that, that refuse to put forth any effort whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I've got one student that has the mighty average of a 25. Oh. I almost got 25 on the test. Uh, a single solitary test. Yeah. This is me being as nice as I possibly <laughs> yeah. can. Yeah. And pretending that his attendance and participation yeah. is yeah. Yeah. in the graduate level complex analysis. But I was, that makes a lot of sense right there. And I was a sophomore. So. Ooh. Well, you know, we always have to have that one class where life just. <laughs> and I managed to recover enough to get a B. Um, Kudos. Yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. You know. um, complex analysis can be real. It was, yeah. It could be. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit, a bit ashamed of it, but you know, the only complex analysis I have is you know, what I'm, what I'm willing to piece together on my own. I wish we had a class here. Um, it's on the books. We just don't find it. Um, Why? Well, the thing is, uh, I, I thought maybe it's changed that physics majors had to take uh, math 436, which is also run as 536. So maybe their requirement has gone away. I don't know. Uh, that seems like a very bad decision. How can you yeah. possibly compare that um, to the complex analysis? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, just don't, I just don't have any recollection of us running the class lately. Or maybe they, maybe they changed to do something else on their end. To make, That's a yeah. possibility. Yeah. So does anyone else have homework for questions? Uh, yes. Uh, one question, Seven. Seven. Um, I'm not, like, I'm not really clear on what's, uh, what's going to be done, but maybe it's time to go Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, really, what that, that means is, is what, what it's asking for is just prove that last part of the theorem. Um, but what, what that means is. Uh, when you okay, I'm gonna go to the theorem here. To, uh, theorem two point six. Um, okay. Um, so, okay. So there's no, there's not much involved. Um, that when you write out the Fourier transform, um, I guess. Addition, so you'd have an integral from minus infinity to infinity. But then you use the fact that f is 0 for uh, negative t. So once you simplify the integral accordingly, then you can basically what you're doing is you're rewriting that integral in terms of a definition of a Laplace transform. Um, because a Laplace transform is an integral from 0 to infinity. Um, yeah, so, and that's why this, this relationship between Fourier and Laplace only applies in that case. Um, yeah, so, so really it's a matter of taking what the definition of a Fourier transform gives you and then rewriting it. So, so in other words, there's, there's not a lot involved. So don't overcomplicate it. <laughs> I have to say that because all students do, from, from Math 101 to 773. <laughs>
can see why I've never overcomplicated anything in my life. The fighting sarcasm should definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think most of the points I've gotten off on assignments have been have begun with that evil fruit. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're a virtuoso at uh, overcomplicating. <laughs> okay. The sad truth is, is you're not the only professor who made that observation. <laughs> well, at least we're consistent about something. Um, it, it may well be the only thing that us faculty can agree on. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, well, but as one of my former department chairs said very often because he cycled through all of his stories and jokes several times, um, was uh, the only thing that any three academics can agree on is that the work of the other two should never be published. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, any other former questions? Okay, um, well, one of the ones you asked me about, which is number, Five. yeah, um, a few people have asked me about that, so I guess if my advice about that could be propagated to <laughs> everyone else. Then, uh, yeah. um, okay, well, in that case, as is the custom, let's get through these four pages. <laughs> um, and yes, it actually is four again. Um, okay. So when we think of function f of t um, defined on the real line, in this class, we think of that as uh, that function f of t as a signal. Uh, it's really just a name. Uh, but mathematically, it's just like any other function of t. But now we're looking at discrete signals. So you can think of those as some function f of t that is sampled at various times. And we can only count on having the... Um, values of f at these select points, which uh, um, in this case will be uh, equally spaced. And uh, some time ago in the, in the previous chapter, chapter 2, um, I covered uh, filters, you know, linear time invariant filters, which that's what you're doing homework on now, or, or will be. Um, so now we're going to see the discrete analog. So basically everything we're seeing in chapter 3 is a discrete analog of what's been seen in chapters one and two. Um, so, so it's good to recognize that, that commonality there. Um, okay, so first, um, we care about discrete linear time invariance. filters. So discrete analogs of the continuous filters that um, we've seen earlier. Okay. Um, so first, notation. Um, the time translation oper operator. Um, so TP applied to a sequence. So x is a sequence now, um, whereas before we'd be time translating functions. So, so x is a sequence, but time translation is also a sequence. So what is the k element of the sequence? All it does is it's an index shift. So it's x sub k minus p. Um, so this is similar to... Um, I want to actually want to make sure I get the notation straight from uh, chapter two. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, we just use a subscript. Um, so compare. f sub a of t is defined to be f of t minus a. So here we're translating also, we're shifting the graph of the, sig the function, the sig continuous signal um, a units to the right. Um, here we are um, 
shifting a sequence. So if, if, if you were to plot the terms of a sequence uh, x, then um, this would have the effect of shifting the terms of a sequence by uh, p units. All, again, it's a shift to the right. <clears throat> okay, um, so uh, just as with uh, continuous filters, we dealt with convolution. We were able to express any linear time invariant filter as convolution with some function. We're going to see the same thing in the, in the discrete case, that um, any uh, discrete linear time invariant filter is convolution with some sequence. Okay, so first I need to define... Um, some things here. Okay, so um, well, suppose we have an operator on sequences. So uh, y equals f of x. So x is a sequence, y is a sequence. So garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so an operator like that is <coughs> time invariant. <coughs> if um, the order in which you apply the operator f and the time translation operator, um, oh. I totally wrote that wrong. It should not be time translator. It sounds like some fancy sci-fi thing. Time translation operator, which sounds a lot more antiseptic. Um, so, so we're not talking about that. And that is what came to mind, but no. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so just really needs to step up our game about this uh, to, to, to help it appeal to masses. Um, <laughs> I would yeah. try and yeah. the students sleep even harder. <laughs> well, I'll, actually, this reminds me of one of my favorite lines from Doctor Who. Uh, so during the Tom Baker years, so this would be around 1974, 75, mm -hmm. um, when uh, in reference to uh, the master, but someone asked the doctor, um, uh, what is the master like with mathematics? Um, and the doctor replied, uh, in mathematics, he's absolutely brilliant. He's almost up to my standard. Uh, so the order in which you apply your operator and the time translation operator um, is irrelevant. That uh, you can translate first, then apply f, or vice versa, and the result is the same. Which is what we saw with uh, continuous time invariant filters. Again, you, you shift and operate. Um, and uh, um, the result is the same. Okay. Um, yeah. There are really going to be no surprises in this section, <laughs> just because I'm just, just restating for, for the, the discrete setting. Uh, so that's one thing we need. Um, and then the other definition I need is um, convolution. Now, convolution of functions we've seen is uh, integral. Um, where uh, one of the functions is uh, like a, has a shift and reflect thing going on. So we have the same idea with convolutional sequences. So we use the same notation, but instead of an integral, it's a sum. So the convolution of two sequences, x and y, is a new sequence. Uh, so the k term in that sequence is a sum minus infinity to infinity of uh, x, k, minus n, y, n. Uh, so same idea here that we have whatever the index is in the sum, it's negated here, and then shifted by k, and then here it's just by itself. Um, so if you were to compare this to the definition of convolution of functions on the real line, uh, you see the similarities. So you can, you can think of this as like being like kind of like a Riemann sum for that... Uh, um, integral definition. Okay. So, what I want to do now is um, show that any uh, 
time, linear time invariant operator on sequences is, um, can be described as convolution with some fixed sequence. Okay, so it's going to be a lot of uh, fun with summations. Make sure I have a better view of a board here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to define a sequence that is a discrete analog of the Dirac delta function. Um, so So I'm going to call this, just for fun, this is my term, Dirac delta sequence. So if you have En and you're looking at the kth term, um, it's just equal to 1 if k is equal to n and 0 otherwise. Um, so I guess really the proper Dirac delta sequence would be the case where uh, n is equal to 0. Uh, but we're allowing um, the 1 to occur wherever. Um, OK. And um, so we, we can show that En is just a uh, translation by n units of uh, E0. So the idea is E0 as a, sequ as a sequence where all the terms are 0 except at um, k equals 0. This is equal to where it's equal to 1. This is equal to 1 at k equals n. And what does time translation do? Shift a um, certain number of units to a right. So that's exactly what's happening because this is a shift n units to the right of this. Um, so if you use the definition of a time translation operator, this is something that you can show um, uh, directly because, um, all right, so, so really, so Tn E0 K is equal to, oh wait, that's a superscript. So that's, E zero K minus N. Um, and this is equal to zero unless K is equal to N, um, which is what we want. All right. Um, now I'm going to define if I have a sequence, um, well, if I have a linear operator F, okay, so, so F B. Linear time invariant. And I'll also define the sequence Fn to be the linear operator applied to En. Okay, so you can think of uh, all these ENs as they're kind of like, just as you have standard basis vectors, like the vectors that are all zeros except one of the entries is one, like the columns of identity matrix. You think of these as like standard basis sequences because they're infinite sequences with a, a one in one position and zero everywhere else. So it's like infinitely long columns of identity. Um, so we can describe a linear operator on all sequences in terms of how the operator behaves on the standard basis sequences because everything here is linear. Okay. Um, and one more piece of notation before I jump into summation land. Um, for, I'm going to abbreviate F0 um, as just F. Um, so, um, uh, for convenience. Okay. So, now what I want to do is I want to apply this um, linear time invariant operator to just any old sequence and describe the action of F in terms of these sequences Fn here. And the fact that F is, uh, capital F is time invariant, um, makes that possible.
Okay. Okay. So now I'll have uh, operator f applied to some given sequence uh, x. So I'm going to describe x in terms of these standard basis sequences, if you will. Um, so we have xn, en. Because this sequence is 1 only in the nth position. So we multiply that by xn, and then we add all the sequences together, and then we have x. Now, f is linear, so we can move f inside the sum, we can move it past the constant uh, xn. So now we have f applied to en, which is fn. Okay. Um, oh, why did I do that? OK, that's actually my next step. And really, it wouldn't have been more sense to go the other way. So I guess I don't need this after all. <laughs> all right. Um, now, well, what is En? En is a shift of E0. All right, so En is Tn of E0. Okay. But F is a linear time invariant operator. So I'm allowed to switch these. Of xn, tn, of f of e0. But um, f of e0 is f0, which is just f. xn, tn of f. Okay. Now, um, so now I have a representation of this sequence uh, for f of x. Now I want to write that in terms of, I want, I want to look at, see what each individual entry of the sequence looks like. So now I look at f of x, but now I'm taking one element, the k element. So that would be the same sum, xn. If I look at tn of f, again, I'm taking the k element. But what does that do? That takes the k minus n element Um, okay, so I have f, like what I wrote over there, k minus n. All right, that's, that's just using a definition of the time translation operator. Um, okay, but what is that? That's a convolution. So it's x convolution f k element. So what I've just shown is that if capital F is any linear time invariant operator on sequences, it can be described as a convolution of x with the sequence f, which is um, the same operator capital F applied to E0, the Dirac delta sequence. <coughs> okay. Um, and assuming that this sequence is absolute, that the, the, the series, its infinite sum is absolutely convergent. Okay. Um, so, um, so in fact, we have a, we actually have a theorem that goes both ways. That um, any linear time invariant operator can be described as a convolution uh, with a certain sequence. Any convolution. Um, and the operation like this, where you're taking x and 
the convolution of some fixed sequence f describes a linear time invariant operator on sequences. Um, so, um, so the two are one and the same. Uh, so convolution with, with sequences um, like f, little f, as opposed to, uh, are equivalent to linear time invariant operators and sequences, capital F. So you can go back and forth, um, you can use one representation or the other. <clears throat> okay, so any questions about these manipulations? So, so we had to use the uh, linearity here, time invariance here, um, definition of a translation operator there, all these things work. Now my next thing, it looks like it could be a cool sci-fi term. The Z transform. really came out of my undergrad classes, that when I first came to USM, I did not write my Z's like this. I just wrote Z like that. And my undergrads in particular got very confused because they thought I was writing two. I needed to distinguish. So I got in the habit of putting this little mark in there. Um, and that seemed to resolve the problem. <laughs> well, you know, the, the funny thing is that there are, well, this is the first time that I've seen a mathematician say, write your Z's this way yeah. so your students don't get confused because yeah. that's that's what I'm interpreting. But the funny thing <laughs> is that you will find a few letters uh -huh. that are written differently. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it just keeps on appearing, and then someday it will dawn. Oh, that's why we do that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I believe most, I mean, if you notice, maybe all of you, or several of you will be taking my class next semester, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Miracle Algebra 610. So, um, I, so I won't mention it now, but when I get to a certain topic in that class, um, you will see, I'll tell a story of how um, at, at, at Stanford, um, writing issues like this and how you write your letters uh, burn me in a very bad way. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and because I, I was substituting for the great Margot Harrison, uh, teaching a similar class, and I looked at her notes and wondered why she used this kind of notation. It seemed unnecessary, and I did not follow what she was doing, and it cost me dearly. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that was a lesson I had to learn the, the, the hard way. Um, so, yeah, um, in front of an audi uh, auditorium of 200 Stanford students. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's not nearly as friendly an atmosphere as in like a class of 10 students at USM. Um, so, oh, uh, some, somewhat akin to a shark pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Different students, uh, I don't care if it's going up on YouTube, but um, they think very highly of themselves. Um, <laughs> well, uh, how, how should I say it? With some justification. Some, yeah, not as much as they think. Um, <laughs> You, you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I'm allowed to say it because I was one of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so, so the Z transform of a sequence uh, X is a function called uh, X hat um, that is a function defined in the interval minus pi to pi with a uh, range of the complex numbers. So, so, so transform maps a sequence to a continuous function, or just a function defined on a continuum. Um, and the definition, so x hat of phi, so phi is our um, independent variable for uh, x hat. Um, so it's sum, okay, xj e to the minus ij. 
Okay. Um, now, um, often this is written as, a different way, x hat of z. This is where the name z transform comes from. Just to make the expression a little, like, a little less cluttered, xj z to the minus j, where z is e to the i phi. Um, so, uh, so what we have here is a change of independent variable. All right. Now, um, what's nice about the uh, the Z transform is uh, let's suppose that I have the sequence X. Um, and this is, all the terms of the sequence are zero, except for an interval of n indices. So in other words, you have non-zero terms for k between 0 and n minus 1. So those n terms are allowed to be non-zero. Everything else is zero. Um, then what happens is, if I take the z transform of x to get x hat, and I evaluate the z transform at selected equally spaced points, uh, so uh, 2 pi, 2k pi over m. Wait a minute, something seems odd here. Okay, I need to resolve a notation thing because that makes it seem like the z transform is defined between. 0 to 2 pi, but I, but the definition I got said minus pi to pi. Now, it may work just fine for any interval um, of length 2 pi, but I want to make sure, see if this is addressed anywhere. Okay, Z transform, okay. Um, Apparently, they just didn't care about that. <laughs> um, now, since it's e to the minus ij phi, phi in minus pi to pi, if, well, because j is an integer, actually, it, it, it's OK because Z transform is 2 pi periodic. So you could define it on any interval of width 2 pi and um, everything, everything works. Okay. I just don't like it though. I think it's a sloppy presentation in the book. Um, okay. So, uh, so what I'll have is the sum. Now, here in the sum I have xj, j going from minus infinity to infinity. But here, the sum is going to be uh, j going from 0 to n minus 1 xj, because those are the only terms where xj is not 0. Um, and then I'll have my exponential, e to the minus ij, and then I fill this in, 2 pi k over n. Um, now, I can rewrite this as xj, and then I have um, e to the 2 pi i over n, that's that number w from the DFT that we saw last time. The minus means take the conjugate, and since w is e to the 2 pi i over n, I still have jk out here. So this is xk hat. So I'll just remind you, w is e to the 2 pi i over n from last time. Um, so in other words, if I have a sequence that only has n non-zero terms, 
and take the z transform evaluated at equally spaced points um, in this domain of uh, with 2 pi, I get the DFT. So the z transform gives me a way of expressing another way of expressing the DFT. So, so the DFT of a compactly supported sequence, in other words, a sequence that's zero except on a finite range, can be viewed as a z-transform evaluated, evaluated equally spaced points. Okay. Um, and where the spacing is uh, uh, 2 pi over n. Um, now, So I'm going to show some interesting properties of the Z-transform. Um, for instance, its uh, relationship to Fourier series from uh, chapter 1. So let's suppose I have a function f with a given Fourier series. So the xn are the coefficients, Fourier series coefficients of f. Um, so and I'll recall the definition of those Fourier series coefficients on the interval uh, minus pi to pi. So now what I'm going to do is, um, okay, take the, uh, all right, um, take the uh, z transform of x. So x hat of phi. So based on the definition of a z transform. Sum of xn e to the minus i n phi. Uh, but that's just f of minus phi because there's no difference between this and this except for a minus there. Um, so, in other words, z transform of a sequence of 40 coefficients is equal to the function corresponding to those 40 series coefficients, except for the reflection. Um, it leads to the minus p instead of p. Okay. So, um, so in other words, the, so a process that maps Fourier series coefficients to the underlying function, um, so you can think of it like as a, as a kind of like an inverse Fourier transform, but for Fourier series, that's the Z-transform essentially. <clears throat> All right. Two pages down. Okay. Um, well, actually, we are roughly halfway through the class period, so I'm on pace. Okay. Um, all right, so, whoops. Next thing to point out about Z transforms um, is isometry. Between little L two and L two, uh, 
Um, so space of square integrable functions versus a space of square summable sequences. Um, okay, so let's suppose we have two sequences, a little L2. Um, then I can use Parseval's equation, which we saw quite some time ago. Uh, if I take the uh, little L2 inner product of these sequences, so summing up xn, yn conjugate, um, then, um, and we're assuming that x, at the xn are a Fourier series coefficients of f, and the yn are a Fourier series coefficients of g. Um, so, what we have here is Parseval's equation gives us this. Uh, we have uh, f of phi g of minus phi, oh, no, sorry, g phi conjugates. Um, so to explain the relationship between f and, uh, like f and g and x and y, we have f, um, x is the sum, x n e to the i n x, and similarly g is the sum of y n e to the i n, I, I shouldn't use x, oops, so all I'm saying is the functions f and g have four e coefficients x n and y n respectively. So that's what, so Parseval's equation lets me, lets me do this. Uh, but taking inner product of these functions in capital L2 is the same as taking the inner product of a Fourier series coefficients in little L2. That's something we covered a while back. But because of a connection with the Fourier series over here, this is the same as saying, replacing f and g with the z transforms of x and y. I just had to substitute, um, instead of phi, I have minus phi. But then what I can do is um, I can make a u substitution in here. Replace phi with minus phi, which doesn't change the limits. So. I can drop the minus. Okay. Um, so prove a substitution, phi goes to minus phi, just because the limits don't change. All right. So, oh, I need a conjugate here. Can't drop that. So g was conjugated, so y hat had to be conjugated. So what this means is 1 over 2 pi inner product of x hat and y hat in capital L2 minus pi to pi is the same as the inner product of x and y in little l2. So except for this factor of 1 over 2 pi, the z transform preserves inner products. Um, and this is based on Parseval's equation, which is also about preservation of inner products between little l2 and capital L2. <clears throat> Any questions on manipulation of this here? Wait, where? Yeah, phi goes to. Oh. Um, so I'm making a change of variable in integral. It's kind of okay. like doing a u substitution. Like if I said u is equal to minus phi, and then I call u phi again. <laughs> and the limits would actually flip, and then I'd flip them back to undo the minus caused by the substitution. Sense some lingering uncertainty. No uncertainty. I'm 
Okay. I would love to ask okay. to see the commutative mapping of that, but that's a useless term because I wouldn't know what it means. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I, it, it's interesting. There's something going on there. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, there's in parcel, but there's something else there. Yeah. Some nice little... Oh, in terms of explaining why it's okay. No, no, just the, just the preservation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Boring. Um, but now let's have some more fun of summations. Convolution. Ooh. And how that relates to the heat transfer. I mean, summations are going to lead to integrals. <laughs> fun with integrals. <laughs> You won't go that far. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, so give us a theorem that um, so f and x are sequences, and little l two. So it turns out that the convolution. Of those sequences, if you take the Z transform of the convolution and evaluate it by, then that's the same as a product of the individual Z transforms. This is similar to what we have for continuous functions, uh, where, um, where, where the uh, Fourier transform of a convolution is equal to the product of the Fourier transforms. So it's certainly not a surprising result. Um, now, um, and so note the terminology, uh, f hat is called the transfer function. Uh, the operator capital F that's defined by the convolution with little f. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier about given um, linear time invariant operator capital F that it can be described as convolution or some sequence um, little f here. So the Z transform of that uh, sequence you take a convolution with is a transfer function. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, prove this. Alright, so I look at <coughs> F convolution X, take the Z transform, evaluate it at phi. So, based on the definition of the Z transform, that would give me F convolution X, term N, times E to the minus I N T. But now what I need to do is express this convolution in terms of the elements of uh, f and x individually. So that would give me f k, x, n minus k. Do I have that right? Yep. Um, okay, so that's the nth element of a convolution. And then we have e to the minus i n p. Okay. Um, then what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to multiply and divide so, so I'll throw in an e to the ik phi and an e to the minus ik phi um, and that will help me separate out uh, the z transforms of f and x. Um, okay. So now what I can do is sum over n, sum over k. So now I'll have fk e to the minus ik phi 
and I have x n minus k e to the minus i n minus k e. So notice, and for both f and x, they're now paired with an exponential, e to the minus i something phi, where the something, that's a minus, believe it or not, minus k, where the something has is the index that you have here. So fk, e to the minus i k phi, x n minus k, e to the minus i n minus k phi. <clears throat> now, Switch fours here. Okay. Um, now that we write this double summation. You know, let m be equal to n minus k, and k remains in the dependent variables, so n is what's going away. So I'm going to have fk e to minus i k p. Now, since n is going from minus infinity to infinity, m is also going from minus infinity to infinity, but I can write the rest of it as x m e to the minus i m b. And the reason for doing that is now I can pull these things apart because this only depends on k and this only depends on m. Um, so I can write it as sum over k And then sum over m. But both of those are fit the definition of a z transform. So this is f hat of phi and x hat of phi, and we're done. So basically, it's hocus pocus with laws of exponents. <laughs> 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 Literally all the students who yet have to use them in that one on one. <laughs> oh, what did you left that there? Is that anybody? It was here when we got here. Oh, okay. So it's some poor English student then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing a lack of sympathy. <laughs> Freshman having to having their life consumed by the GEC. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, don't need that. All right. One page left. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, the last thing to talk about for the Z transform. Um, adjoint of convolution. So first, uh, make sure everybody knows the definition of uh, adjoint. So, so F star is a notation I use to refer to the adjoint of F. So F is some linear operator. F star is the adjoint. And the way we can define the adjoint is in terms of inner products. So if I have an inner product f of x with y, then I can move f from x to y as long as I actually take the adjoint. Okay. Um, and we're assuming here that this is on a little l2. So x and y are sequences. Capital F is some operator on sequences. Um, and the simplest example of uh, 
at joints linear operators comes from something you learned in your first linear algebra course about the properties of a transpose, for instance. So because we have x transpose a y, so in this case a is, you can think of a as a linear operator being applied to y, uh, then you take the inner product of x. So you can think of this as x a y. Um, where there's here the angle brackets are just a standard dot product uh, and dimensional Euclidean space. Um, so um, I can write this as x transpose a transpose transpose. Then I can use the fact that the product of a trans uh, transpose of a product is a product of a transpose in reverse order. So that's a transpose x transpose y, which is a transpose x inner product with y. So that's what happened here. I had the a applied to y. I shifted it over to the x, which is fine as long as I remember to take the transpose, which is the adjoint of a real matrix. <coughs> Whereas if it's complex, you've got to take the Hermitian transpose and conjugate it. Um, so that's the simplest example for uh, um, adjoint of an operator. Um, I should mention that um, if you think about it as a total, it seems like a total non sequitur, but it really isn't. Integration by parts. You have integral of u dv is equal to u d minus integral of v du. Because what are you doing? You're taking a differentiation operator that is applied to v at first, and you're shifting it onto u. Well, differentiation is a skew self adjoint operator, kind of like a skew symmetric matrix. You take the adjoint and it negates it. Uh, so that's why that minus needs to be there um, in the integration of parts. Okay, now, so what about? Z transform. So I have a theorem. Um, related to that. Okay. Um, so if you have some operator f, and you know uh, that there's a linear time invariant operator, so that's associated with a sequence little f that you take a convolution with. Well, what sequence is associated with the adjoint operator? So it turns out that's easy to get. So, so let's suppose you have f x is defined to be the convolution of little f uh, x. Okay. Um, then turns out that the adjoint operator is a convolution of a sequence that I'll call f star. Um, so, a, so that's a sequence for the adjoint operator. And the way to find f star is the nth term of f star is that all you do is you take your sequence f, negate the index, and you also take the uh, complex conjugate. Um, so that's one result for this theorem. And we can also say something about the uh, uh, transfer function. Um, okay. So a transfer function is when well, you take the transfer function for the original operator. And just conjugate it. Okay. So I'll go ahead and prove this, and that'll be it for today. Um, so I start with the inner products f of x with some arbitrary sequence y, and I can write that as a convolution. And I want to be able to express this as the inner product of 
x with something applied to y, and that something would be the adjoint. So, um, okay. So I'll write this in terms of the definition, uh, L2 inner product. So that would be F convolution x, nth element, y nth element conjugate. Okay. And then I'll write out the convolution. So this is kind of like what I was doing in the last proof. So I have f k x n minus k y n conjugate. Oh, actually, for this proof, I need to. I can, convolution is commutative, so I can switch these indices. So I really want f n minus k x k. All right. Now I'm going to rewrite this summation. I'm going to move the uh, Summation, uh, summation over k would be the outer one. So I have xk here. And then I have sum over n, and I have fn minus k yn conjugate. Okay. So I'd like to express that as a convolution. Um, but here's the problem with that. In this case, my convolution, I have the kth element of a convolution. And I have the indices minus k and k here. But um, here I'm summing over n, and the n's have the same sign. So as written, not a convolution with f. <coughs> but if I take f and reverse it, then it becomes a convolution. But this is conjugated, this is not. So I gotta conjugate that too. So, so what I'll do is I'm gonna move a conjugation out to the whole sum over n, which is okay as long as I conjugate f. So I have f conjugate. Um, and then I have minus k minus n, and then yn. Oh, I forgot the xk. Okay. All right. So let's recap what happened here. If I take this conjugate, the big one, and move it inside, it undoes the conjugate of f. So I have nothing. And then y gets conjugated. So you see why I haven't really changed anything. And as for the um, index, all I've done is I've factored out a minus and negated accordingly. All right. But now, this whole thing is equal to f star k minus m. Now I have a convolution. Okay, so I have xk, and now I have still this big old conjugate outside, but um, this is f star conjugate, or sorry, convolution of y, kth element. Um, oh, mistake in the notes. I was thinking earlier, I haven't made a mistake in the notes yet. Had to happen sometime. It's just the nature of notes. Mm. The note gremlins just add <laughs> things in latex. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. Um, okay. And then this is an inner product over L2 of what? X. And then F star Y. Okay, so, um, so in other words, this is what we're taking the inner product of, with y, so that has to be the adjoint. Okay. And now we know how to describe the adjoint. It's a convolution 
with this sequence. Okay, so that takes care of the first part of the theorem. There's still the matter of the um, uh, transfer function, because how do I get the transfer function? I need to take the z-transform of this sequence. So that's what the, z, that's what the transfer function is. You have a linear operator. It's conv time invariant. It's a convolution of some sequence. Take the z-transform of the sequence. That's the transfer function. So that's what I'll do. I'll get the transfer function. Takes us from minus infinity to infinity. So now I have Fn conjugates e to the i n phi. But I can write this as a big old conjugate of Fn. So I'm pulling the conjugate out of here, which is fine as long as I conjugate this back. conjugate is the transfer function for, uh, for f. So to get the transfer function for f at joint, turns out all you have to do is conjugate. And that's it. <laughs> OK. Um, so that actually brings us to the end of chapter three. Um, I uh, posted homework problems. I did this on Monday. The homework problems for all of chapter three. And I want to check when I made that do. Um, next Monday. Uh, oh, I actually made it next Wednesday. So, but whatever you guys get it done. <laughs> um, well, there will certainly be, that was, that's chapter three. I'll start chapter four next week. There will certainly be an assignment on chapter four. Uh, we may run out of time to have something on chapter five, but I want to cover it anyway. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So, so we're going to have at least six homeworks, at the very most seven, but we'll just see what we have time for. So Thanksgiving coming up. And, <laughs> so. All right. So that'll do it. <laughs>